To the casual eye, it may look like nothing more than a sleepy little fishing village, typical of those found throughout the Caribbean. But Port Royal is different. Beneath its waters lies a unique time capsule, a sunken city more than 300 years old. Port Royal is the most important underwater archaeological site in the Western Hemisphere. There's more history and archaeology down there than 50 or 100 shipwrecks all combined. The history of Port Royal's sunken city, its legendary rise, its catastrophic fall, and promising rebirth begins in the middle of the 17th century when European nations fought over possession of land in the New World. It's hard to underestimate the importance of the Caribbean in that period. The Caribbean was the Wild West for Europe. It was the frontier. And the pirates and the privateers, the buccaneers, they were the vanguard of the expansionist countries and responsible for achieving nationalist aims and also for a lot of the immigration. If the Caribbean was Europe's Wild West, then Port Royal was its Dodge City, a boom town full of pirates, prostitutes, and purveyors, and where silver and gold were as plentiful as rum. Its rapid growth began just after England seized Jamaica from Spain. Spain was wealthy but weak, and England and the other European powers wanted their share of the New World riches. And Jamaica was in a wonderful location, and Port Royal an even better one, on the south side of the island, with a wonderful sweeping quay that formed a natural harbor that could easily hold 500 ships. Nearly everyone, it seems, in Port Royal was a pirate at one time or another. Protecting the island in exchange for plunder was too good an offer to refuse. Being a pirate was a very opportunistic way of making a living. People would do it off and on, and so it wasn't that you was a pirate exclusively. You might be working in a tavern in Port Royal, and then one of the merchants is fronting the money for an individual, and they're going to go off on a raiding uh, at one of the coastal uh, Spanish towns, and so you would go with them. But then when you came back, well, you, know, you would just go back to your normal job. So it was an occupation that people crisscrossed back and forth at all the time. Commodore Christopher Mings, a British naval officer and a privateer, brought in Port Royal's first Great Hall. More than 20 chests filled with silver coins and gems worth half a million pounds. His tactics earned him the nickname El Diablo, the devil from the Spaniards. These hand grenades help explain why. Mings and his successors used them as part of their arsenal to terrorize Spanish vessels carrying trade goods from Europe and the Orient. The iron balls filled with gunpowder were lit with a fuse, then tossed onto the deck of a galleon. The explosion caused death and injury. Or treasury of the West Indies is always like a continual mart or fair, where all sorts of choice merchandises are daily imported. As this salvaged Japanese sword suggests, the markets of Port Royal were a cornucopia of plunder and contraband, a place where anything Oriental objects of art to African slaves could be had for a price. Any of the material that was coming in through piracy into Port Royal within two or three days was now in the hands of the merchants. And so uh, it's the mercantile uh, industry of Port Royal that actually made it the wealthiest uh, English town in the New World. Port Royal was also the most populous English town in the New World. Bigger than Boston, it boasted a population of between six and 8,000 people. A brass menorah recovered from a sunken synagogue reflects their diversity. At a time when the British colonies of North America were largely single-faith enclaves, Port Royal supported Jewish, Quaker, Catholic, and Anglican houses of worship. The local clergy's faith, however, was sorely tested. One out of every four buildings in town was either a brothel or a tavern, prompting one reverend to condemn Port Royal as the most wicked and sinful place on earth. The pirates' decadent ways were indeed legendary. When they returned from their adventures, they were only too eager to blow their booty, indulging their every vice. According to an early history of Jamaica, wine and women drained them of their wealth to such a degree that in little time, some of them were reduced to beggary. 
Port Royal's most celebrated prostitute, Mary Carlton, was likened to a barber's chair. No sooner was one out than another was in. The governor of Port Royal commented that the Spaniards wondered much at the sickness of our people until they knew the strength of our drinks, but then wondered more that they were not all dead. Port Royal, the wicked city, was noted for its drinking, debauchery, gambling, etc. And of course, these guys imbibed from morning to night. And a lot of guys made their own drinks, especially the rum, which was called Kill Devil's Rum. And uh, a lot of times it was mixed with gunpowder. And in the house of a David Owens that we worked in, we found his still. This was used for making rum. Of course, it was heated under here. The, and uh, stuff was distilled and put in onion bottles like you see here so named because of the shape and in this particular house we found several hundred of these onion bottles a lot of them were still sealed we had used hypodermic needles and got an idea what the contents were and these guys didn't mess around just with drinking with little small glasses or jiggers they used big things like you see here this is a german beer stein made of stoneware or you could call it a tankard it's actually a shape of a tankard some people call them flagons and so you can imagine it would take two of these bottles just to fill one of these and when a guy was drunk or came back from a new sortie where he captured a whole bunch of treasure, they'd go down with barrels, running down the street with barrels, and insist everybody had to take a drink. And they'd fill this thing to the brim and said, chug a lug. And could you imagine drinking that much run? You just pass out and fall on your bippy. So those were the great days to live. Too bad I couldn't have been there myself. If there was one man who personified Port Royal's raucous social scene, he was Henry Morgan, pirate extraordinaire. He didn't just raid ships, he invaded countries. His exploits, more than anyone else's, would give Port Royal its mythic aura. Of all the pirates who made their base in Port Royal, none was more famous than Henry Morgan. He had come to Jamaica from Wales as an indentured servant, but soon took up freebooting. His exploits on the high seas made him the most celebrated and feared pirate of the 17th century. He's separated from other pirates because he was a brilliant tactician. He was courageous, many of them are, but in spite of the fact that he often had fallings out with the men of his company, he was incredibly successful. Morgan's expeditions rivaled those of any nation's army of the period. His most ambitious raid took place in 1670, when his force of 2,000 buccaneers invaded Panama City, the main depository of Spanish gold and silver on Central America's Pacific coast. They made an incredible trek through the jungle. They didn't take any stores with them. They counted on finding food. They didn't. They almost starved to death. The men were actually cutting up their shoes and boiling the shoe leather and their le pieces of their leather pouches to eat. When Morgan's force finally arrived in Panama City, a desperate battle ensued in which fleeing Spanish soldiers burned the city down and loaded its treasures onto departing ships. Once in control, Morgan's men tortured residents until they revealed where they had hidden their valuables. The booty piled up quickly. Silver plate, gold ingots, and 750,000 pieces of eight. When they got back to the Caribbean coast, again at great cost to life, men dropping of uh, disease and jungle fever, there was a falling out. After all that effort, there were only 200 pieces of eight per man. When Morgan sailed off ahead of some of the men, they felt that he had skimmed off the best for himself. The men may have been referring to these pieces. Rarely put on public view, they are known as Morgan Silver, believed to be the only known plunder remaining from the raid on Panama City. Upon his return to Port Royal, Morgan was hailed as a conquering hero, but King Charles was not pleased. England was now at peace with Spain. The Spanish king threatened to declare war if those who destroyed Panama City went unpunished. In response, King Charles imprisoned the colonial governor who approved Morgan's venture. But a different fate awaited the popular pirate. The British Crown really needed to get rid of the pirates at this point because they were developing their own commercial, viable uh, colonies and, and the pirates were becoming an embarrassment. And so what a better way to catch pirates than to set a pirate to do it. 
The king knighted Morgan and appointed him lieutenant governor of Jamaica. By day, he sat in judgment of his fellow buccaneers. But at night, he secretly arranged for them to continue their trade for a price. But it was Sir Henry who ultimately paid it. It must have been extremely difficult for Morgan to have been the buccaneer par excellence and then have to sit in judgment on petty pirates and buccaneers. And he sank into debauchery and drunkenness and was a kind of a shambling old mess at the end. But this is the story of piracy. And it's certainly the story of uh, Port Royal, which was brash and bright for a while and then was extinguished. Morgan died a bitter, broken alcoholic in 1688. A short poem mourned the passage of the man and his times. You was a flyer, Morgan. You was the lad to crowd when you was in your flagship. But now you're in your shroud. Morgan's era was over, but Port Royal continued to thrive into the early 1690s as a pirate haven. Sometimes we're as many as 150 buccaneer pirate ships right in here, and of all different nationalities. I mean, we're talking about people who were plundering in the Red Sea, plundering off of Madagascar, all around the world. They all came here. But the boom could have gone bust at any moment, not from sudden political changes, but rather from geological shifts. Port Royal was precariously situated on a thin spit of land at the tip of the Palisados Peninsula. It's unconsolidated sand with the water table of one foot to two feet beneath it. And uh, so and they build this town up on it, and you can't dig foundations for the houses because you hit the water table uh, uh, too quickly. As a result, Port Royal has always been vulnerable to natural disasters. Just how much can be seen in this structure, the Giddy House. It tipped over in an earthquake in 1907 and got its name from the sense of disorientation it induces in those who enter. It's nothing, however, compared to what Port Royal experienced back in June 1692. The denizens of Port Royal were no strangers to catastrophe. They were frequently beset by hurricanes. They'd had an earthquake four years earlier, a minor one. But the morning of June 7th was frightening to those few people who were up really early and saw that the sea was strangely glassy. As the morning wore on, it was terribly sultry. The air was very heavy. And the sky turned a brassy color shortly before noon. There was an absolutely apocalyptic event. In many places, recounted a survivor, the earth cracked, opened, and shut with a motion quick and fast. And of these openings, two or three hundred might be seen at a time. In some of these, people were swallowed up. In others, they were caught in the middle and pressed to death. And in others, the heads only appeared, in which condition the dogs came and ate them. Here you have 2,000 buildings and all but about 160 slid into the sea in a matter of seconds because there were also three tidal waves and almost all the shipping in the harbor got all freaked up and thrown on top of the buildings and it's really scary. It's like some of these Hollywood movies, but this actually happened to these people. Perhaps the most compelling account of the earthquake is etched on the headstone of Louis Galdi in the graveyard of St. Peter's Church. He was swallowed up in the great earthquake by another shock thrown into the sea and miraculously saved by swimming until a boat took him up. Galdi was one of the few to survive. He went on to become a church warden. The fate of his fellow citizens must have given him cause for prayer. 2,000 people, about a third of Port Royal's population, died immediately in the disaster. Approximately the same number perished in the following weeks from diseases caused by the rotting of unburied corpses. The town itself was devastated. 33 acres, nearly two-thirds of Port Royal, collapsed into the sea. Gone was everything from five of the island's six forts to Henry Morgan's grave. Even in its decimated state, Port Royal's notorious reputation survived. Looters roamed the streets, cutting off the fingers of the dead to more easily pilfer their rings. Others dove into the water, recovering what they could from the rubble below. 
clergyman preached this catastrophe of biblical proportions was God's punishment for Port Royal's wicked ways. Perhaps they were right. The town was never the same. Though rebuilt, it was hit by a series of hurricanes and fires that drove many residents to relocate to Kingston, a new settlement that became the island capital. Scientists, however, have another explanation for the cause of the disaster. The key to the destruction at Port Royal is the fact that it's on this unconsolidated sand. And when you get unconsolidated sand like that and in a major earthquake, the violent shaking suspends every particle of sand with water momentarily. So what is firm foundation ground at one point now is just a liquid. It's just like water. Whether by liquefaction or God's wrath, the earthquake turned Port Royal into an instant time capsule. Like Pompeii and Herculaneum, Roman cities buried by a volcano in 79 AD, Port Royal was now that rarest of archaeological phenomena, a catastrophic site. The thing about Port Royal that makes it so special and unique uh, is the fact it's the only sunken city in the New World. There's not another one like it because of its historical importance and the extremely good preservation present at the town. It's the dream of any nautical archaeologist to excavate. Edwin Link was the first nautical archaeologist to make that dream come true. In 1959, under the auspices of the National Geographic Society and the Smithsonian Institution, he led an expedition to survey the sunken city. Link conducted his work about a hundred yards offshore, near a buoy known as the Church Beacon. Legend holds that it marks the site where St. Paul's Church sank in the earthquake. Beneath the buoy, Link recovered a wealth of artifacts, none more intriguing than this pocket watch. An X-ray photograph of the face reveals traces of its vanished hands stopped at 11.43. It was probably the first time in the history of archaeology that the, the, the actual time of the destruction is actually recorded with frozen hands on a watch dial. Link's expedition literally put Old Port Royal on the map and changed the minds of skeptics who believed that because of reconsolidation, a natural landfill process, there was little, if anything, left of the sunken city. Link's the greatest contribution was the fact that he proved that there was a sunken city down there and that it had great merit to have somebody have a bigger project. That somebody was Bob Marks, an underwater archaeologist. He would lead his own expedition five years later and recover enough artifacts to rival the plunder of any Port Royal pirate. Edwin Link's 1959 expedition to Port Royal and his recovery of the pocket watch indicating the time of the earthquake intrigued many with the probability of more treasures to be found below. Perhaps no one was more curious than Bob Marks, an underwater archaeologist imbued with the lore of the sunken city. When I was five years old, I read a book about a guy who claimed that he walked the streets of Port Royal. The cathedral bell was chiming. Skeletons were in the taverns with flagons in their hands, drinking the booze. And I read that over and over and over, and I kept saying, one of these days, I'm going to go there and do that. That day came in 1964, when a development company announced plans to turn Port Royal into a Caribbean version of Colonial Williamsburg. That meant dredging for cruise ship piers, right where the sunken city was located. When Marx heard that news, he took action. I was able to convince the governments with the help of the organization American States and UNESCO, both organizations which I was consulted to on underwater archaeology, to save all the goodies down there. And little did I know at the time that I'd spend the next four years around the clock working and only do a tiny part of the site, like 5% of the overall site. Marx excavated that portion of the site most threatened by the proposed dredging. Working in depths as low as 25 feet, he used an airlift long vacuum-like tube to pump the silt onto a barge where small artifacts collected on a screen. Marx didn't know what he would find, but he had a dream. From the very, very beginning when I first started the excavation here at Port Royal in 1964, I dreamt about, let's find Henry Morgan's grave 
because we knew he was buried at Port Royal, or at least his tombstone. Marx's quest wasn't easy. Sewage from Kingston severely limited underwater visibility. Sharks lurked nearby. Cave-ins and earthquakes threatened. You're working in a cesspool, but the information that you're getting, you can't get anyplace else. So we put up with it day in, day out. And every morning, you know, I'd wake up so excited to say, okay, what am I going to find today? Apparently, a lot. Marx may not have found Morgan's grave, but he and his divers seem to have salvaged everything else. They recovered thus far the largest haul of artifacts from the sunken city. In the millions, by Marx's own estimate, all of which fit his definition of treasure. Treasure is anything of importance to mankind that comes out of the sea or from a land site. So treasure doesn't have to be gold and silver. It's something that's interesting for people, and it's something that adds to the knowledge of the past. That's what treasure is. Some of Marx's most interesting treasures are the oldest ever found in Jamaica. Soon after I started the excavation, I realized that others had lived there before the pirates settled in Port Royal in 1655 because I began finding Arawak artifacts. Arawaks were the first settlers on the island. They were there at least 1000 AD, and they were all over the Caribbean and different islands. And some of the first artifacts we found were these religious figurines that you see here, made out of stone, probably of Indian gods. And we found several of those also in wood, in very good condition. And the next thing we started to find was a number of ceramic vases and pots like you see here. This particular one here is really great because it's in the shape of an Arawak canoe that was used mainly for fishing and transportation between the islands. And these adzes or axe heads are interesting because these two here are made out of jadeite and the nearest source of jadeite is Guatemala which shows that they had trade you know, all the way to Central America. The two biggest are weapons used to fight and the smaller one is used as kind of a axe for chopping wood or digging out a canoe or something like that. So it really was great to find all these Indian artifacts on the site. Most of Marx's finds are fittingly stored in a landmark building, Port Royal's Old Naval Hospital, built in 1819 and owned by the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. As the main repository for Marx's artifacts, the hospital has become a latter-day version of the city that sank just beyond its seawall. The grounds are littered with artillery Marx brought up from various shipwrecks, including mortar balls from what is believed to be the Ranger, a vessel that once belonged to pirate Black Bart Roberts, and cannon from what may be the HMS Swan, a British naval vessel that was thrown onto a building by one of the three tidal waves that followed the 1692 earthquake. Even the outhouses claim a connection to Port Royal's storied past. The bricks are recycled from the hundreds of thousands Marx reclaimed from the sunken city. Inside the hospital where naval officers once awaited treatment, artifacts await further study. A small selection reveals how life was lived in the pirate town at the time of the great quake. This was originally thought to be a cooking baster, but analysis of its contents at the British Museum revealed that it's really a urethra syringe. With it, a mixture of lime and molasses was injected into a man's penis to treat venereal disease. These lead pieces were used as weights in the fish and meat markets. Their markings, however, indicate an amount more than they actually weigh. Whoever patronized the salesman who used them got cheated. And a crushed pewter chamber pot permanently bears the impact of the earthquake's brutal force. But it's in the Institute of Jamaica, in Kingston, that one finds perhaps Marx's most valuable object. Every diver dreams of finding a treasure chest. And here, I actually found the wooden chest, and inside were 3,000 of the most perfect silver coins. Because the same anaerobic conditions that protects all the organic material also protected the silver. And they were the most perfect coins I ever found. This piece of eight, plundered by pirates from a Spanish galleon, is one of the few left from Marx's excavation. It's kept in a vault because most of the other coins have since disappeared and are presumed stolen. Grim proof of 
their irresistible allure. It also provided the irrefutable proof the Jamaican government required to halt the planned dredging of the harbor. Because of Marx's work, the sunken city would not be disturbed, but rather discovered anew by future underwater explorers. Every underwater expedition to the sunken city at Port Royal has been distinctive. Edwin Link's 1959 exploration was the first and raised tantalizing possibilities for those who followed. The dig conducted by Bob Marks in the 1960s was the largest, yielding the greatest quantity of artifacts. In 1981, the longest and most detailed study of Port Royal began when the Jamaican government invited the Institute of Nautical Archaeology at Texas A&M to excavate. Donnie Hamilton led the expedition. Originally I said, okay, I will go one year and see what the conditions are like. So when we went out there, we found that we could conduct controlled excavations. We could take photographs. We could take underwater video. We could find artifacts. So what started to be a one-year trial excavation turned out to be 10 years of going to Jamaica. From that first year, we saw that there wasn't another site like it, probably in the world, that's comparable to what you find at Port Royal. Anybody who's interested in 17th century English archaeology, that's the site to excavate. Unlike Bob Marks, whose site was predetermined by proposed harbor dredging, Hamilton could choose where he wanted to excavate. After consulting period maps of Port Royal, he selected what was once a busy intersection in the commercial center of town. This area was chosen because it's probably the only portion of the sunken city where one finds buildings that sank vertically with minimal distortion. This phenomenon was caused by the liquefaction that occurred during the earthquake. Hamilton's team uncovered eight buildings, ranging from a probable tavern and cobbler shop to private residences. Using a water dredge, a more flexible version of an airlift, Hamilton's team gathered artifacts at depths of less than 15 feet. It was just the first step of many to conserve the past. Underwater archaeology is very expensive in terms of conservation. While we may spend three months working in the summer, it may take three to five years to conserve all the artifacts we bring up in one excavation season. Hamilton explains the steps involved in the conservation of metal objects, the kind most susceptible to decay and encrustation. The biggest problem we have with the artifacts from Port Royal is the, just the fact that they're all covered with marine growth from being 300 years in the salt water. And so the first process we have to go through is x-raying them to find out exactly what is inside each one of these encrustations or concretions. We take each encrusted object and uh, make an x-ray of it before we start the conservation process and then the x-ray shows the interior detail. On this x-ray you can see the trigger of a gun Here's the side plate of the gun, the uh, spring inside behind the side plate, and then part of the hammer uh, which held the gun flint. And the x-ray shows us clearly the, uh, the degree of preservation and it determines the next process as we go through. As soon as we evalu evaluate the x-ray and determine what's inside, then we just start mechanically cleaning the encrustation off the uh, object. <laughs> Once we remove all the encrustation off an, of an object, if there's any substantial metal remaining, uh, we just put it into an electrolytic vat and the electrical current as it flows through the object loosens up all the encrustation or the uh, uh, corrosion products and it allows it just, you know, you flake it off with your finger. And this in the process, it stabilizes the metal. Then after we go through electrolysis, we just go through a rinsing process to remove all the residue of this chemical and then we seal the object off in a vat of microcrystalline wax which then uh, stabilizes it and we're allowed to put it on display there. This cross-section of artifacts collected by Hamilton and his underwater archaeologists illustrates the vibrant and varied life that flourished in Port Royal during the latter half of the 17th century. Onion-shaped liquor bottles and a clay pipe recall the laissez-faire attitude of the social scene. A cannonball and shot gauge confirm the strategic importance of the harbor. 
A porcelain Chinese food dog offers exotic evidence of Port Royal status as an international trading post. And a gold wedding ring, buckles, and a pearl earring hint at Port Royal's wealth. Ironically, they do not fit Hamilton's definition of treasure. I'm an archaeologist, so I define treasure in terms of data. Data is a treasure uh, because data is interpretable. You can do something with it. Gold, to me, is immaterial, but does it have marks on it that I can identify to a maker or to a time period? It directs our research, tells us where to go to find the historic documents or the records that fill in the gaps, and so that's what's a treasure to me. To Hamilton, these seemingly ordinary pewter plates are treasure because they bear the mark of its maker, a pineapple with the initials SB. Searching for who SB was turns an archaeologist into a detective and demonstrates the invaluable role documents play in reconstructing the past. After consulting several archives, including a 1680 Port Royal census, Hamilton discovered that SB was Simon Benning local pewter maker. Further research located his will, providing information on his family and property holdings, while his inventory quantified his success as a pewter maker. We know from Simon Benning's inventory that he had over 2,000 finished plates, in which is a very large inventory. Essentially, he's the only pewter maker in the entire island. With only a set of initials as his starting point, Hamilton's research ended with a profile of Simon Benning, Port Royal's pewter maker. He was likely born in Tothill, England, came to Port Royal via Barbados around 1663, bought property on High Street, had a wife, two sons, and a daughter, prospered in his trade, and died in 1687, five years before the Great Quake. I like Simon Benning because essentially I brought him back to life through the excavation and the research that we conducted uh, with the artifacts that we could re relate back to him. Bringing back to life the citizens of Port Royal doesn't always require an artifact with a mark on it or documentation. Sometimes the past becomes more human simply by an act of compassion. While excavating the last structure on their site, Hamilton and his team found the remains of three children caught in the quake. It was enough to stir the heart of even the most professionally detached archaeologist. One child was at the back hearth and the wall fell over and so the child was between the wall and the floor. And then we found another child at the front door of the house. Either the child was either running into the house or running out of the house, but it was right at the front door. So in a situation like that, you know, it, there is an, an emotional involvement. Hamilton had the children's remains buried in the graveyard of St. Peter's Church. Their modest tablet may not lure any treasure seekers, but it's valuable in its own right. It's the only memorial to the victims of the earthquake of 1692. In spite of the impressive recoveries made by the Link, Marx, and Hamilton expeditions, much of Port Royal has yet to be explored. Of the 33 acres that originally sank, 20 have been lost to reconsolidation, nature's own landfill process. Of the remaining 13 sunken acres, only three and a half have been excavated. Only a very small area of Port Royal has been excavated because it is such a time-consuming thing to work underwater and because you're working in 10 centimeter levels as you dig, it takes a long time to excavate a single area. Marianne Franklin, a PhD candidate at the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, is planning the next excavation at Port Royal. Her site is the shipwreck of what is believed to be the Ranger, a vessel with a curious history. Of French origin, it was seized off the west coast of Africa by Bartholomew Roberts, also known as Black Bart, one of history's most infamous pirates. 
He was interesting because unlike most uh, pirates, he was a teetotaler. And he made his men uh, sign articles. You, every pirate had to sign articles agreeing to the rules of the ship. And his included uh, no swearing and no drinking and lights out by 8 o'clock. <laughs> On the high seas, however, Black Bart was a terror, raiding and plundering at will during the early 18th century. The British Navy finally brought him down after a long pursuit and a short battle off the Guinea coast. Following Robert's bloody death, the Ranger returned to Port Royal, where it sank in a hurricane in 1722. Bob Marks located a shipwreck during his excavations in the 1960s that loosely fit the description of the vessel. Franklin intends to determine definitively if it is the Ranger. She doesn't expect to find pirate plunder on board during this exploratory dive. Anything of monetary value has long since been salvaged. But Franklin does hope to find her own version of treasure. Treasure for an archaeologist is not material goods, things you can hold or sell for monetary value. What's neat is that you can go down, look at the archaeological record, put it with a historical record, and get a better understanding of a different time in the past to make sure that the information you find gets to the public so that kids can understand because if you just keep what you find to yourself you're no better than the pirates. The interesting thing about finding the ranger and doing this excavation now is as we speak they're excavating Blackbeard's vessel Queen Anne's Revenge off the coast of Carolina. These two vessels were both used by the pirates at the end of the golden age of piracy in 1721 so archaeologically we'll have something to compare it to from the same era another vessel and these are the only two ships that have been excavated by archaeologists using controlled techniques. But Bob Marx proves, however, that one need not utilize the controlled techniques of an archaeologist to recover a wealth of artifacts in the waters off Port Royal. He shows just how easy it is during his first return to the sunken city in over 30 years. I went out there in 40 minutes just using snorkel equipment because no scuba equipment was available. And hand fanning with my little hand, I went and found all these little goodies you hear, you see here. And it gives you an idea of the diversity of different stuff there. Among Marx's finds are broken bits of Chinese porcelain, musket balls, a child's marble, broken pipe stems. These two, when put together, reveal where the pipe was made, Glasgow, Scotland. And a nondescript chip is actually a coin, a Spanish piece of two. When one looks carefully, the coat of arms of the Spanish king becomes partially visible. So this was all in 40 minutes. I didn't really expect to find anything. And of course I was excited as the first day that I'd ever been on a site. Port Royal has the greatest potential in the Western Hemisphere for the field of underwater archaeology and maritime history. Developers seek to capitalize on that potential by transforming the sleepy little fishing village into a tourist attraction. Ironically, Bob Marx's excavations in the 60s halted a similar plan when proposed dredging for cruise ship piers threatened the very existence of the sunken city. But this time, according to the new plan's chief proponent, it will be different things have changed significantly and we're putting in the cruise ship pier in an area where we do not need to dredge and this is an area far enough away from the sunken city that there will be minimal if any impact on the sunken city of Port Royal. The whole way that development is done has changed. The redevelopment plan will take between five and ten years to complete at a cost of more than 50 million dollars. It features the restoration of historical landmarks and the construction of shops, taverns, and restaurants staffed by local residents in period costumes. The most ambitious part of the plan calls for the installation of an underwater museum, believed to be the first of its kind, from which tourists can look out onto historically accurate diorama scenes of life in the sunken city. The entire redevelopment project is intended to give Port Royal a major facelift without destroying its fragile natural beauty and cultural significance. 
we will be cognizant of two major issues. Number one, the environmental impact, and we're doing environmental impact assessment studies as we speak. Secondly, we're going to be doing an archaeological impact assessment study, which is going to look at all the archaeology of the area to ensure minimal impact. So we are very cognizant, and if we need to change the plans, we will, in order to ensure that there's minimal impact. When completed, it's expected that the redeveloped Port Royal will be as prosperous as it was in its heyday, attracting people from all over the world and taking in enough gold and silver to rival Henry Morgan's fortune. We've run our numbers on the economic impact. You're talking about 25,000 people visiting Port Royal on a weekly basis, each spending in the range of 100 US. When you multiply that by 50 odd weeks, you know, you're talking about significant amounts of money, about 125 million US per year, coming into the economy in Port Royal and Kingston, but Jamaica generally. Despite its notorious past, the future of Port Royal holds great promise, and that's a treasure sure to enrich everyone. We believe that Port Royal is an absolute treasure because it can be transformed into something which serves a very positive and useful purpose in terms of education, in terms of understanding of our history, in terms of understanding how people related to each other in a peaceful and vibrant way. They possessed no cranes, power tools, or computers, and yet they were able to engineer the most impressive architectural achievements to ever see the light of day. Join Peter Weller, Egypt, Engineering an Empire, Thursday at 9 on 8.